Thank you once again, all those who are here and also those who are on the Zoom. May the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you. We started a new series of the Bible study last week. And uh, our main study will come to the book of Romans. And that will be supplemented with the book of Galatians and also the book of Ephesians. However, I thought it is very important to have an introduction. Instead of simply jumping into the book of Romans, it's very important that we understand the context. Because a lot of people think that Christian life is just an emotional uh, life. However, we need to understand that emotion, though it plays a significant role in our life, especially spiritual life, there is a deeper understanding that has to come to us through the word about God's relationship with us and what God is doing. Uh, in Ephesians, we can see God revealing His will to humanity through the Holy Apostles when the Holy Spirit came upon them. One significant question to ask that place is, we are always asked, what is God's will for me? That is a question we often ask and we seek people, even prophets. Can you tell me what is God's will for me? But I tend to address that issue in a little different way. More than knowing what is God's will for you, we have to ask him, what is your will? That's different than what is his will for us. It is God who is doing something. And once we know what he is doing, then we can easily fit into that plan. Rather than asking, what is God's will for me? God is doing something. That is why Jesus said, you know, I told you everything that I am thinking, so that you more, no more my just disciples, you're my friends. Because you opened his heart. And that we can see in the book of Ephesians, we'll study in detail later, God's desire that was hidden for ages in him, which has a mystery, was that all things in him, Christ, all things in heaven and all things on earth should become one. That is God's will. Everything that he does is towards that fulfillment. Uh, that is why we need to understand something beyond what is God's will for us. Uh, we all say that Bible talks about, as I said last week, our redemption plan. Then I said that then Bible is anthropocentric because centered on man. No, he is not. It is centered on Christ. We are, happen to be in his plan, but the plan goes beyond that. So we need to understand Bible is Christocentric. Bible is nothing but about Christ. It's not about you and me. But it becomes about you and me when we are in him. And that is the thing that we need to clearly understand. That is why we need to know what God is doing. So without an overall understanding of the scripture, we cannot understand what God is doing. So once you get an overall picture, then we can dive into different portions of the scripture and then we can understand that. Uh, I will uh, show you a slide uh, with, um, with a quote, which uh, let me share a screen. Martin Luther said, let me open a slide. See here, this is Martin Luther saying, this epistle is the chief book of the New Testament, the purest gospel. It deserves not only really to be known word for word by every Christian, but to be the subject of his meditation day by day. Then he goes on to say, Luther also spoke of it as a light and way into the whole scripture. See, what I meant is that we need to get into the scripture. If you don't understand the holistic concept in it, then we are only looking at a certain portion without understanding the overall picture of it. That's why Luther is saying that very clearly here. He's saying that a light and a way into the whole scripture. Okay, so what we wanted to go into the understand the overall scripture, a, a general picture, and then we can go by 
to understand where and we are coming into the book of Romans to understand the fundamentals of our faith. So the study, we first part we did, we will doing will be the authority of the word. When I showed you last time, I showed the whole course, but I thought in the context of this Roman study, that may be too large. So I took away some of those things. I just, just included, number one is the inspiration of the Bible, genuineness and authenticity of the Bible, canon of the Bible, and then division and structure of the Bible and the language of the Bible. This much only I'm including now. So last week, for those who are listening to this lecture, we were seeing the first one that is the inspiration of the word. And then we moved on to the genuineness and authenticity of the Bible. Those two things we covered last week. Now today, I am moving into the canon of the Bible. Canon of the Bible. See, first of all, we have to make a statement that everything that we believe, everything that we profess, everything that we teach is based on the authority of the Bible. That is why it is very important to go through and understand. Because this Bible, anything that it teaches, we take it as God's word. In the inspiration part, we mentioned that Bible is inspired book. The different kinds of inspirations we have talked about, but this is divinely inspired by God. And we believe that Bible is the word of God, not that Bible contains God's word. It is entirely God's word, and it is a full revelation of God as it is needed for us. Bible is a revelation of Jesus Christ. So I said, Bible is Christocentric, the subject is Christ, and Christ is fully revealed. Probably you may argue that there is more to be revealed, but based on the scripture, we understand whatever that is needed for humanity at this point of time has been revealed. So. In the book of Revelation, we can see the book is sealed. It, that's the end of it. So if somebody comes and tells you that I have a new revelation, we have to understand that that is not acceptable. That's not acceptable at all. All that has to be revealed has been revealed. And what does it mean to be revealed? Reveal, revelation or revealing is showing that which was not shown earlier. So God's heart or God's plans that was not completely shown to humanity in this word, God has revealed to us. And I believe there are a lot more we will understand. I and mean, even the Bible itself says, now we see him only like in a mirror. But when we see him face to face, everything will be a different dimension. But that is yet to come. But in the meantime, we believe that no more revelation is needed. What is needed is only a illumination. Illumination and revelation are different. Bible is a revelation of Jesus Christ, but when we read through that book, what we understand is not revelation, that's an illumination. We are illuminating, or God is illuminating by the Holy Spirit, that portion that is already revealed earlier. So, that, and also we saw that Bible is genuine. And authentic. One of the basic questions that we addressed last week was normally for a human mind, they will ask the question, do you have the originals of these books? The question is no, we don't have the originals. Then we later we came to understand that there are about 2800 manuscripts and then added to that the our new uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, you can add to that. So there are so many manuscripts that are already there and there is a literary rule that if there are about 20 manuscripts which agree, that is as good as original. That is the way they take it. So based on that understanding, they, they assume that that Bible is uh, genuine and authentic. Now the next one that we have to come to is the canon of the Bible. How did these books come together? Now we have 39 books in the Old Testament. 27 in the New Testament, start of 66 books. So how these books were put together? And there are because there are several books that are there which 
Some church groups accept it, some don't accept it. For example, there are 14 books in the Apocrypha, which is included in the Roman Catholic Bible, but not in us. So all those matters have to be considered in this. So let me read here. Canon means in Greek, a straight road. Uh, even now, I, mean, I think I mentioned last time that when you buy clothes, you go to a store and say, I want one meter cloth. We, they will measure one meter and give you. They use a yardstick to do that, a measuring stick, stick to do that. But you cannot say that that is the one meter. When you say one meter, we, it is a platinum road kept somewhere in London in a, in a climatically controlled chamber. And that length of that platinum road is one meter. This is, the, uh, this is a road that is kept there. See, whenever we say something, we refer to that. The same way, canon in Greek means a straight road, which is by which everything is measured. Everything is standard. The canon of truth are referring to the restriction of the number of books. So there are two parts in it. The first one is canon of truth, referring to the restriction of the number of books that compose the sacred volume. How did these 66 books come together? That is one part of it. Second, the rule of faith and life. This book is the rule of our faith and life, referring to the application of the sacred scriptures as a rule for our lives. Incidentally, I was, a few years back, I was talking to a scientist who was a great evolutionary biologist, and he was very much, uh, yeah. he was very much uh, interested in uh, Environment ethics is a very great thing now. So I incidentally, he was a he was an atheist at that time. Later became a believer, but I'm, I asked him a question: What do you base your environmental ethics? Is it based on what people think? If we as a group we think okay, this is what has to be done. Does that make the two ethics? For example, during the Nazi time, they thought you should have a eugenics program where all the disabled people should be castrated and removed. For them, their group of people came together and they put that, is it ethical? So if you and I are the ethical standard or we form the ethical standard, then that can change anyone, anytime. So until and unless Anything we call about ethics, unless it is founded on an unchanging God, then it has no basis. That is why we read in the Bible very clearly, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. That statement, sometimes we take in the context that, oh, God was there to help me, God is there to help me now, God will help me in future too. That is only a small, small part of the statement. A God who is unchanging is fundamental in our spiritual life. Not only spiritual life, in our human life. Everything and everything can be only having a foundation if only, if only we have a permanency of God, unchanging God. The same way, this Bible gives us the rule of our faith and life. If somebody comes to argue, we can tell them this is what the Bible teaches and this is what we abide with. If you have something else, it's up to you. We have to clearly say that this is our own. Because nowadays, even in the Christian world, there is a thinking that a lot of writings are coming. We are also evolving human mind. So things should be evolved and uh, don't st uh, stay like very dogmatic about what is in here. On that, we are very careful. Anything and everything I speak here or we believe in a church is centered on this. Nothing outside of it. That's why we read nothing should be taken out or added to that. In this sense, in this sense, it is used in Galatians 6.16. Let me read those two scriptures here. Galatians 6.16. They're very important. Galatians 6.16, we read, Peace 
and mercy be upon all who walk by this rule upon the Israel of God. See, those who walk by this rule, everything is based on this rule or this that is this word that is being revealed to us. Secondly, in Philippians chapter 316 also, that is referred there, Philippians 316. We read, <clears throat> only let us hold true to what we have attained. <clears throat> Holding true to what we have attained, what we are, what has been revealed to us. This is very fundamental in this. Uh, that those of us who are of mature be thus minded, and if anything you are otherwise minded, God will reveal that to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. In the sense in which we use the word in this chapter is that the books are canonical, which Christians have regarded as authentic, genuine, and divine authority and inspiration. That has to be laid clear. If somebody has a question about that, then we cannot speak on the same plane. By un uncanonical books, we mean those that are not included in the canon, such as the Apocrypha, the Shepherd of Hermas, the Epistle of Barnabas, all those things. These kinds of books, we don't make it as a rule for our life. Now, why was canon necessary? Why was canon necessary? The, the canonic thinking of the New Testament started in the, second, uh, in the second century. But as soon as the apostles died, were dead, and with them inspiration ceased, there's another question. We say that all these books that are in the scripture are inspired by God. Do you encounter conversations where people say the books even written now are inspired? Do people come and argue that? I was talking to somebody very knowledgeable in the scripture recently. He was saying that God is continuously revealing. I was in a meeting uh, on Zoom with from ministers from different countries. And one person was so vehemently telling, Pastor, I cannot accept your argument because I believe God is progressively revealing things to us. What more we can tell him? We have nothing to argue. We can tell them, you don't believe me. That is very important. As soon as the apostles died, the inspiration, the context that we talk about ceased. It became necessary that their writings be gathered together to know what the messages to the churches were and to preserve those writings from corruption. Even when Paul was there, Paul is saying, others are writing. He says, even if I myself come and tell you something, let me be accursed. So even Paul is saying that whatever he wrote at that time, that is authoritative, that is genuine, authentic and genuine, that is the inspiration. But if I myself come back and write something, don't take it. To that extent, he's talking about it. So to, second point is to preclude the possibility of additions to the number of inspired books. We have to make sure that nothing more is added. The emperor, and the third point is Emperor of Emperor Diocletian issued in AD 302 an edict that all sacred books should be destroyed by fire. See, there is a great gap. The books that are before that are the ones that are missing. But copies later of made were found. So any books beyond that, they were not able to find it. And they are saying there could be two reasons. Number one, a lot of those could have been burned off. Or number two, the forefathers of the time, they must have collected those books and hidden somewhere. And it is not probably that this scroll, maybe something like that they were hiding. So they are no more available. But based on our, uh, our, our discussion about authenticity and the genuine, 
nest of the Bible, we assume that because there are enough uh, manuscripts, we consider it as authentic. Now, so this is one of the reasons why they were on this. Now, how was the canon of the Bible formed? Canon of the Old Testament was easy to, for us to understand. The real problem was the canon of the New Testament. Because we can let us look at the Old Testament canon, because it, it progressively developed over the years, but before Christ. But by the time Christ came, pretty much they had the book. <clears throat> so the formation of the Old Testament canon was gradual and was composed of the writings which spread over many centuries. Moses commanded the books of the law be placed in the ark. That is the beginning of the canon, actually. He made that book to be in the, in the ark. The sacred books were kept there during the wilderness journey and also were in the ark during its permanent residence in Jerusalem. That is referred in Deuteronomy 31, all those scriptures that refers to that. And then, again, they were gathered and placed in the temple, in the temple, the historical and prophetical books from Joshua to David's time. Then were gathered and placed in the temple, the historical and prophetical books from Joshua to David. See, we had uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. We assume that Moses wrote it. So those books are already in the collection. And then later, they added books from Joshua to David. Because David time was very significant. Because David wrote considerably. And they were all deposited in that collection. And then Solomon deposited it in it earlier books. Uh, the reference is given in 2 Kings 22 8. It talks about that. Isaiah 34, 16 also we see that. And enriched the collection with inspired writings from his own pen. That is, Solomon himself wrote, and he also added to that. So starting from, you can see Moses starting that canon with his books. And then, by the time David, within that period of time, the books from Joshua to David were put in. And then, the main uh, figure in that canon was Solomon. He formed all of them together and brought it together. And so we find Daniel referring to the books, Isaiah to the book of the Lord. Because that collection was already there. That is why Daniel was referring to the books and Isaiah to the book of the Lord. That you can see the references there where it's being said there. So by the time we can see even the captivity time, they had that book together. So to that later added were the prophetical books. After Solomon's day, a succession of prophets arose. Jonah, Amos, Isaiah, Hosea, Joel, Micah, Nahum, Sephaniah, Jeremiah, Badiah, and Habakkuk. These all flourished before the destruction of the temple. These are, they were all pre-exiling prophets. So they had those writings and, and uh, they all flourished before the destruction of the temple and enlarged the collection of existing sacred books by valuable addition. So that was all added before the exile happened. After the Babylonian culture capture, when the temple was rebuilt and worship reestablished, then doubtless were added the writings of Haggai and Zechariah. We can see later one of the key role played was by Ezra. Now we can see that. Next slide. About 50 years after the temple was rebuilt, Ezra made a collection of sacred writings. Ezra was, a, was another third person. I know. You can see Moses. Then we can see David. And then we can see Solomon. Then comes Ezra. Ezra did a great job and made a collection of the sacred writings. To this collection were added the writings of Nehemiah, Malachi, and Ezra. It is a fact of history that Nehemiah gathered the acts of the kings and the prophets. So the prophetic books probably were added by Nehemiah. And Ezra and Nehemiah, they both worked on that. And those and those of David when founding a library for the second temple. 
So during the second temple, they must have had a great uh, library collections and they, all these books were collected to that together. And they say there's a reference in Maccabees in the, in the Apocrypha, there's a reference to that. So the canon of the Old Testament in the form we now have, it was the work of Ezra and a great synagogue, and another terminology, a great synagogue. That is about 120 members established by Ezra and all as a great team, and they were working on it. Uh, Jews, that directed the Jews chiefly in religious matters. So from 450 to 200 BC. And made significant contributions to Jewish liturgy and the Bible at that time. So Yeshua did a considerable work. He was a scribe and he was a scholar. It's very interesting in the temple, Serubabel was in the line of David. He came and he was a governor appointed and he built the temple. And then Yeshua came and fit and put all the, uh, the, the priest, I mean, the literature and liturgy and all the stuff, the worship and everything he put in place. And then came Nehemiah. He added to what Esra did, but also he built the wall as well. Yeah. Uh, this fact is borne witness to the most ancient Jewish writings. The great synagogue was composed of Esra, Nehemiah, Agai, Zechariah, and Malik. There is no doubt that such a collection of books existed in the time of the Lord and the Apostles. One of the clear way of understanding that is, when Jesus was explaining to the disciples who were going to Emmaus, he very specifically said from the law and the prophets and the Psalms. So the whole collection of that book was there at the time of Jesus Christ. So that's why I said, when Jesus referred to those books, automatically it is canonized. There's no more question about it. So there is not much question about the Old Testament canon. The problem was in the New Testament only. Yeah. <clears throat> See, Luke 24, that's what I referred to. Uh, there is evidence of division into three parts, the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. Jesus himself. The direct citations of the Old Testament and the New Testament amount to about 280. That's another thing. What was quoted from the Old Testament by the writers of the New Testament? They say they have quoted about 280 passages, I mean quoted, including all references about 850. So a considerable part of that book was referred in the New Testament. Many a places, you know, when Jesus came and spoke, in the temple, immediately say, that's what Isaiah wrote. All those things, immediately they put the reference there. So the total about 850 references are in the New Testament, referring to the Old Testament. So that all adds to the canon of the Old Testament. It is already there. The Old Testament canon was formed gradually, receiving its final editions during the period beginning with Ezra and ending about 330 BC. That is good because that is, that is clear because after that there was no voice from God. Around 400 years, there was no voice from God. That is, then after 400 years only, John the Baptist came and said, uh, repent. So that, those 400 years was a dark time for Israel. They didn't have much word from God and they were in a dark time. That's why we read, those who sat in darkness saw a great light. Very clearly, it's referred all that. <clears throat> now comes the really difficult part, the New Testament canon. Let me read through this. The New Testament canon was gradually added to the Old Testament, but it was some considerable time after the Lord's ascension before any of these books contained in it were actually written. These New Testament books were written much after the Jesus' ascension. The first steps in the formation of a canon of authoritative Christian books worthy to stand beside the Old Testament canon, which is the Bible of our Lord and his apostles, appear to, have appear to have taken about the beginning of the second century. That's what I mean. Only from the second century, the New Testament was slowly added. When there is evidence for the circulation of two collections of Christian writings in the church, this is probably from Josephus and other people who are historians 
who wrote probably there were two books that was in circulation. One, and uh, probably one was telling the gospel, I suppose. You read there later. At a very early date, it appears that the four gospels were united in one collection. Yes. So the one book they talked about was the gospel. The four gospels united in one collection. They must have been brought together very soon after the writing of the gospel according to John. Because if it's the one book, the last book written was John, so probably they are collected after the John's writing. This fourfold collection was known originally as the Gospel. And we always say Gospel according to man. That's the correct usage. Because there's only one Gospel uh, being narrated by four people. So the Gospel in the singular, not the Gospels in the plural, there was only one gospel narrated in four records. Distinguished as according to Matthew, according to Mark, gospel according to Matthew, according to Mark, and so on. About AD 115, Ignatius, the Bishop of Antioch, refers to the gospel as an authoritative writing. And as he knew more than one of the four gospels, it may well be that by gospel he means the fourfold collection which went by that name. So first of all, we can see Ignatius was one of the persons who gave an authority or said that the four collections, uh, he refers to gospel as an authority right? That's in AD 115. <clears throat> there are then these are technology, the terminologies which are not very important to us. Those books they were all brought together to be added or not, they consider them as two sections. One is called Homo Logovina. Must be, I don't know what term. Is it Latin or Greek? I don't know. I eh? agree. <laughs> and Anti Legomena. That means the first, at the time of the formation of the New Testament canon, 20 out of the 27 books were readily and universally accepted as genuine and therefore called homo logomena. Acknowledge that's what it means is that they are acknowledged that one. These 20 books were the Gospels, the Acts, the Epistle of Paul, Epistles of Paul and the first Epistle of John and Peter. These 20 books were already there. The other seven books, Hebrews, of course we can understand why Hebrews was not included. Because there was no author written there. Nobody in our uh, genuineness and authenticity, the name of the author is important. And his name was not there. And second and third John, I don't know why they didn't put it there. Second Peter, Jude, James, Revelation were disputed for a time by particular churches and were therefore called anti legomena or disputed. But they were added later. Then came the Apocrypha books, ap apocryphal books. There are 14 of them. Some people say there are 15. But have you heard of 14 or 15? 14 is what they normally say, but some people say there are 15 there. Apocryphal book contains 14, 14 books, namely 1 and 2, Estras, Tobit, Judith, the rest of Esther, Wisdom, Ecclesiasticus, Baruch, the Song of the Three Children, the Story of Susanna, Bell and the Dragon and the Prayer of Manassas and 1 and 2 Maccabees. Okay, so this is all what I want to say about the canon in, in so you understand in a simple language. Old Testament canon was not much difficult for us because there was a book by the time Jesus was there and Jesus acknowledged those books so automatically we have the canon for that book. And that started with Moses and later we can see David and Solomon coming into the picture. And then we can see mostly Ezra and Nehemiah. They compile the whole book. That must, that must be the way we understand that. <clears throat> but in the New Testament, uh, as we see, the first 20 books were accepted on a wider scale, but the rest seven books were added later. Uh, we could go further into this uh, canon, but to me, that's not very important. 
with my reference to my studies on Romans. But just to, just to tell you how the Bible came together. So now we have uh, the 66 books. Now what is important is to know the chronology and the historical connection of these books. How they relate. That is very important. Because when you start the book, we see in the book of Genesis, the historical or account of the creation. And then we come to see the big flood. And then we see they are building a tower, Tower of Babylon, Babel. But then God changed the languages. All those things we can see in the first chapters of the Genesis. But then significantly, one person comes into the picture. That's from where we, we especially believers, we base our faith matters starting with Abraham. That's very important to understand from the time God called Abraham. We need to understand thoroughly how the call was, what happened after that. So in the Old Testament, there are 39 books, as I mentioned here, first five books are called the Pentateuch. Uh, Genesis, which gives a history of the creation and the flood, the fall of man, is very important, and then the flood, and then well, when it comes to chapter 12, uh, Abraham comes into picture. And then the book of Genesis ends with the death of Joseph. Because in the book of Genesis, Abraham was called by God. We'll get all those details in Romans because that's very important. The book of Romans, the first chapters entirely goes on or even the whole book makes several references to Abraham and the whole faith matter. But Abraham gave birth to Isaac. Isaac gave birth to Jacob. And when God called Abraham, God said, I'll bless you. But he did not stop there. He said, I will bless you and you will become a blessing to the nations. And then there is a specific blessing, all that will go in detail when I come to Romans. They about a descendant, about which Paul speaks in the book of Galatians, descendant in the singular. In your descendant, the nations of the world will be blessed. So very clearly, that's what Paul later refers and says that God's plan is for the Gentiles as well. It's very clear. And then we can see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob and jo uh, 12 sons, and Joseph was one among them. And Joseph was sold off to the merchants by his brothers, and he ended up in Egypt. And after some time, he became the prime minister of the Egypt. And through his wise management of the resources in Egypt, he was elevated to high position. And later we see the story how his brothers came and uh, wanted to buy grains. And then after some time, uh, uh, Joseph reveals himself to his brothers. And then he goes back and brings his, their father also. So the whole Israel, uh, that Israel name was given to Jacob and they moved into Egypt and there they multiplied. 430 years, over 400 hour years, they were in Egypt as slaves. And after that, we see again, the book of Exodus starts there. So when, when Joseph was dead in, in Egypt, he, they took his body and buried there, but they told them, you will go from this place. When you go, make sure that you take my bones with you. And see, they were so sure that they were very clear about God's promises to Abraham. And uh, that is why when they were traveling, in that big night where there was so much commotion of the plague and people dying and packing everything and leaving, for sure, Moses had the bones of Joseph with him. 
So when they travel, Joseph's born was also traveling with them. And so when it came to the book of Exodus, we see how God heard the cry of his people and saw the afflictions of the people and God took them out. And then we see that God, they were walking in the wilderness for 40 years. Often we see that they walked around because of their lack of faith. I'm not negating that, that's been true. But I must say that the 40 years was the most fruitful time for humanity. Isn't it? Everything that we base on our social and uh, human civilization has been disclosed to them while they were in that wilderness. Because Moses wrote it all that. And they explained to the people, but they couldn't understand at that time. But I must say, those 40 years were the most uh, uh, productive or fruitful time for humanity. Because almost all the laws and all the things that we base our, our civilized world is based on Moses' writing. So it was a great time, those 40 years. And also, not only he gave the law, he taught, them, he taught them about worship, about the temple. There is no other place in the scripture so much has been revealed by God than in that 40 years. So I must say that 40 years was the most productive time of human history. I look at that. that. There was a Bible college at that time or a time of God revealing himself in a, there were shadows, but those, the, the shadows of that realities were clearly drawn before them so that they understand. They're preparing them for that. But then we come to the book of Leviticus. That's a continuation about the teachings that God gave in the a book of Genesis, oh, sorry, in the book of Exodus. In the book of Leviticus, we can see God giving them more specified information about the five sacrifices, the burnt offering, the food offering, the peace offering, sin offering, and guilt offering. And all details are given there. And also God spoke to them about the priesthood. All those are nothing but teaching us about Christ. Just like, you know, when you as kids grow, you don't give them a, a what do you call, a, 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 a bulldozer to learn, but they, but they will give them a toy for that. They play with that, that they understand the concept in that. The same way, they were given shadows of the realities, but the realities uh, they knew later. But the teaching has started right there about all the spiritual realities that continued into the Leviticus. Leviticus, the main subject is worship and also the priesthood. And then we can see, as Brother David was doing for quite a long time, the seven festivals, which is actually a whole summary of the redemptive plan. We can see how things uh, uh, unfolded later. And also, we, when you read through the book of Leviticus, all the moral laws that a civilized humanity should follow, I mean, very clearly laid out there, even to the minute details, how to treat the servants, how to treat women, how all those things are very clearly laid out in the book of Leviticus. Leviticus is one of the very important books in the scripture and which seldom you read because for them it's very difficult. When you read uh, Exodus, it's a good story because people follow that as a story. Interesting. But when you land into the book of Leviticus, you will read one of the chapters and then stop it. But I must say, that's a book that we should thoroughly study. Because that has got the fundamentals of all our religious and faith in it. And then it comes to Numbers. And uh, Numbers is also a continuation of what the theme. And in Deuteronomy, actually it's a revision of the whole thing. And Moses at the end of his time, he's telling the people how you are summarizing all that the Lord has revealed to him and how to follow that very clearly given in the book of Deuteronomy. So that everything foundational about our faith has started in, in these five books. So without studying those five books, we cannot really understand the New Testament. That's very important also. 
Because a lot of people in the modern churches say that Old Testament time is over. Now we are in the New Testament. So why do you want to preach from the Old Testament? Uh, to me, there's only one book. And the theme is ongoing. It is slowly being revealed. So without studying the first five books of the Bible, we cannot put a strong foundation for our faith. And also there we can see God directly speaking to his people and God making covenants. And everything that God does, as I mentioned several times in the church, he is based on the covenants and the promises that he makes. So progressively you can see God revealing and, and promising and things later come into picture. And now after that, when you come to the book of Joshua, so actually he's in the Old Testament, when you start with chapter 12 of Genesis, the story becomes the story of the people of Israel. Starting from Abraham, though the name Israel came from Jacob, but you can see that the story is unfolding about the people of Israel. So the, the whole Old Testament is pretty much the story of the people of Israel. But in that is embedded of a story, the story of the whole humanity. Because that story was the precursor for the whole human story. That is why God chose one man to fulfill his purposes. There was a basic mistake happened. Because Israel thought that they were chosen to be blessed. And that ended there for them. But we have to understand Israel is special. Israel is special because Israel is chosen for a special purpose. That purpose doesn't end with Israel. They are part of that purpose in the divine purpose of God, which he was revealed later by Paul and the great apostles in the New Testament. So they had lost that, that they thought God chose us because all others were sinners and we were privileged to be blessed. But even when he made promises to Abraham, God said, through your descendant, I will bless the nations. So nation salvation is so much as a, remember my brother, brother uh, uh, Deepak was doing that Isaiah, how many times it has been mentioned there, your God blessing nations, because that was in the God's divine plan. Israel's main mistake was that they did not realize that. They thought it ends by themselves. And now from Joshua, the people are coming back to the land that is promised to them. And they, Joshua, in the first seven chap 11 chapters of Joshua, it was continual fighting. Though they were promised the promised land, every inch had to be fought. And till the 11th chapter, you will be disheartened when you read that, isn't it? Blood, 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 killing, killing, killing. And by the end of the 11th chapter, it says, peace came upon the land. And he divided the land and he gave to the 12 tribes of Israel. <clears throat> That's what we see. And then after that, after the time of Joshua, Joshua was the first judge. This is again Israel went in the wrong path. Because God said, I am your king. God was leading the people by himself. That is why, you know, church has to understand. Church was what, that's what the moral that we see up to uh, Saul. Because God will raise people at his time to do certain things. And there is nothing being carried on like a, like a royalty. Here, Abraham, here uh, David dies, his son becomes a king. His son, Jehovah, becomes a king. Like that. But just not God's plan. God wanted to lead his people as he led with the judges. In a way, church is pretty close to that. Because we say head of the church is Christ. We are only members of that body of Christ. So a true understanding of the concept of the church is extremely essential because that is the greatest thinking. And that is what God was revealing them. 
But Israel lost it because Israel was being taught toward that direction. But just like other people, they wanted to have a king. And then you know the story how uh, Samuel went to God and said, you know, they have rejected me. And God said, they didn't reject you, they rejected me. Give them a king and then they will learn the problem. So after Joshua, Judges rule, and then story of the Ruth comes in between, like a story that happened at that time. That story is again a redemption story. We know that. And then first Samuel, second Samuel is actually a judges period continuation. He was judge and the prophet. But at the time of Samuel, we know that he anointed King Saul. And then after Saul, David became the king. And after him, his son Solomon became the king. And after him came uh, Solomon, his son Rehoboam became the king. At that time, the kingdom was divided into two. The northern kingdom Israel and the southern kingdom Judah. And they had kings on both sides, good and bad, but mostly in the Israel, they had bad kings compared to. That also we will see later in our study. And the king's stories are given in the first kings and second kings and also in Samuel. And also in the first chronicles and second chronicles, it's still talking about the history, how people went through to the rule of different kings. But then towards the end of the kings, we can see the northern country, Israel, was captured by the Assyrians. And they were taken away. And there is no history of them coming back. There were 10 tribes. But the two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, remained in, in, uh, in, uh, in Jerusalem. But later, uh, I, have a, I have another uh, timeline, just show you a slide later, that they were captured by the Babylonians. And the temple was destroyed and everything was taken away. And they were, even before they were taken as captives to Babylon, God spoke through pre-exiled prophecy time of Jeremiah that after 70 years, I'll bring them back. And Isaiah also prophesied that King Cyrus is my servant and he will build the temple. So the temple that, the great temple that was built by Solomon was completely destroyed. And later, after 70 years, the Media Persian Empire was taken over by the Sorry, the Babylonian Empire was taken over by the Media Persian Empire. And King Cyrus, when he was the king, he asked anybody from Israel, go back and build the temple. And that's how, under the leadership of Surabhavid, he came and he built the temple. It took about 50 years to finish that temple. But that's where the story Esra starts. Rebuilding, coming back. That's right, Nehemiah are two books, books which are highly, the theme is restoration. The temple and the kingdom that was lost, they came back and they built the temple. They built, started the worship. We read in the, in the canon how Yesra compiled all the books. All those things they did, but never forget the fact that they did not get the country. They only built the temple there. After the Babylonian Empire, Medo-Persia Empire came, then the Greek Empire came, then the Roman Empire came. It is at the Roman Empire time that Jesus was born. So still, even at the time of Jesus, uh, the country was under the Romans and these people were not having the country of their own. So now we will go to the next part. There are three poetical books. So, so these, those books, 12 books are history books. And then there are three poetical books, Job, Psalms, and the Song of Songs. And uh, we know Song of Songs is written by, by Solomon. And Psalms, we know we have many, many uh, authors there, mostly David. And Job's book is a history book also. It is also the poetical books, which we know the story of uh, Job. And then there are two wisdom books, both written by mostly Solomon. Then this is the main part that we have to understand. 
This is a little difficult part to study. The other thing, other, all other things we can read as a story. But when it comes to prophetic books, that is where we have difficulty to understand. There are 17 prophetic books in the Old Testament. And they are called, five of them are called major prophetic books. That is uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, uh, and uh, Ezekiel, and Daniel. These four or five books are called as major prophets. They are not based on the, the name of the prophet. They are based on the size of the books. And 12 books are minor prophets, minor prophets. The period of the prophets of Israel covered over 500 years, approximately 10 to 15 centuries BC. That is when the prophets prophetical time. How many prophetic books are in the Old Testament? 17, we already seen that. They are divided into major and minor. The major are Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Zechariah, and Daniel. Now, some of the prophets lived before exile. This is important to understand. Some of the prophets lived before the exile, while some lived during the exile, and some after the exile. Their names are here. Obadiah, Joel, Jonah, Amos, Hosea, Isaiah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Jeremiah. Jeremiah actually was pre-exiling and also he was an exilic because he was taken also to the Babylon. So he, he can be considered in both. And Lamentations, there are pre-exiling prophets. And the prophets Ezekiel and Daniel were prophets who prophesied during the exile. So, Bible students will always understand that particular term exile. This is very important in the history of Jewish people. That means the time when the temple was destroyed and everything was taken away by Babylonians and Assyrians. Babylonians took, especially Jerusalem and all that, uh, to Babylon. And Assyrians took away. And we don't know whether any of them came back. And these three poverty books are very important. That is post exile. They are Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Haggai and Zechariah are very important because Zerubbabel and the team came to build the temple, but it took 50 years for them to do that. And several times they were ready to quit. Just like our Sanskrit It took five years almost. So it's tough. Can you imagine 15 years they're doing with a lot of enemies also? So several times. They thought there were two problems. You can see that in the book of Zechariah and Agai, that uh, there were two leaders. Zerubbabel was the builder, and there was a priest with them, Joshua. And they both had problems. Because after some time, Zerubbabel thought he can't do it. He got, exa he got exhausted. He got really discouraged. And uh, we read there as a big mountain in front of him. And then these prophets come and propel them and encourage them and give them prophetic words that you will finish that temple. But the problem with Yeshua was different. He was a priest, but he got involved in many other things and he, he felt that his government was all state. Uh, he thought, thought he lost his, his sanctification and his holiness. So he felt that I'm not fit to do that ministry again. Sometimes that happens in our hectic life. But God said, take that cloth from him, put on a new one on him. There's a very wonderful book, this Haggai and Sakura, because it gives us tremendous encouragement that God's promises will be fulfilled. Even when we are tired, God will send his prophets to encourage you and make you go forward. And it ends with the book of Malachi. And then 400 years was dark time. Israel never heard anything from them. They were in darkness. It is a, the Bible tells us that when there is no word from God, there's a dark time. There's no revelation from God. There's no vision from God. People are not in darkness. But then in the New Testament, uh, now it is good to know the prophets in Israel and Judah. We read all these prophets' names, but which part they belong to. Uh, Jonah, Amos, and Hosea were prophets in Israel. 
uh, pre-exilic prophets. Pre-exilic prophets in Judah, Obadiah, Joel, Isaiah, Micah, and Nahu, Habakkuk, Sephaniah, and Jeremiah. An exciting prophet of Judah, Ezekiel and Daniel. And post exciting prophets, as we read earlier, of Judah, as Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. So, though we talk about all the prophets, some belong to Israel and some belong to Judah. And now, this is a chronological order of the prophets, also important study. Uh, the oldest is Joel, BC 850. Jonah is about BC 800. Amos was around 780. Hosea 760. Micah 740. Nahum 660. Sephaniah 630. Habakkuk 627. Jeremiah 626. And Abadiah 585. This approximate. So some, some historical understanding of how these prophecies came. So the more recent ones were Jeremiah. And that, that is quite natural because Jeremiah was exiled too. too yeah. <clears throat> now let me move to the next one. The book of the Bible, New Testament. The gospel, four gospels. You cannot say gospels, gospel. Uh, according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And there's one history book, that's Acts of the Apostles history book. And there are 21 episodes. See, the book of the, the gospel gives us the life and the teachings of Christ. The gospel introduces us to Christ. But what does it mean to us? That is being written by the, the apostles, the letters. In scientific uh, scientific. Uh, Literature, it is quite common that people publish a lot of papers. Then sometimes some people write a review article. They'll take all the contemporary papers and they will write a review. That's a great job. And uh, from that writing, we connect all these things to the review. When you read the review article, you get a connection with all these publications and give us, a, give us an understanding where we stand now. The same way, the writings of the gospel Paul took that, mainly Paul, and other than they made them understand what it is. They always consider, because coming from the scientific background, I always consider the epistles as review articles of the true publications that are, that, that is the gospel. And they are one, uh, we have uh, 13 Pauline epistles. Some people attribute uh, Hebrew also to him, but I don't because it's not written there. Paul very clearly always writes. Whenever he writes, is an I, Paul, and he writes. But we don't see that in the Hebrews. Some people say it's, Hebrew, it's Paul, but some doesn't. What do you think? <clears throat> I, I, I may not be correct, but uh, one of the persons who had a good understanding of all this was, was Apollos. Mm -hmm. He had a good understanding of history and all, yeah. but he did not quite understand the New Testament fully, but uh, one time I thought could be a philosopher, but there is not much support to that. But still, anyway, we don't know. This is a matter. We know that the book is a great book, and the subject of the book is supremacy of Christ. Yeah. There's no other book which brings up Christ that much like the book of Hebrews. And that book is addressed to suffering Hebrews who have fought a lot for the faith at the beginning, but they were getting exhausted, they are getting tired. And then the writer is writing just to propel them and move forward. Hold on to the great faith that we have in Christ. That is what the intention of that book was. And then we have one prophetic book in the New Testament, that is the book of Proverbs. So we'll stop it there and next week we'll briefly go into the language of the Bible and then we'll get into the book of Romans.